Hi there. I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more conversations. Henry Timms is with us, the unconventional but tremendously effective CEO at Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts, the jewel in the crown of New York City's cultural attractions. Lincoln Center is the umbrella entity for 10 arts organizations, including the Metropolitan Opera, Jazz at Lincoln Center, New York City Ballet, New York Philharmonic, and Lincoln Center Theater. Since taking the wheel at 2019 as Link Inc.'s 11th leader, he has presided over the $550 million renovation of David Geffen Hall and expanded programming to include outdoor concerts of hip hop, K pop, and even an LGBTQ mariachi group. Henry Timms is having a lot of fun at Lincoln Center, and so has the New York community, and we're pleased to welcome him to the program. It's great to be here. Now, Henry, you were generally acknowledged to be a wild success as the CEO of Lincoln Center. Uh, how would you <laughs> I, I'm not sure that's How true. would you define success, and what is your secret? Uh, I, uh, we, 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 we've made some progress at Lincoln Center. I don't think it's anywhere near, near wild, but I think it's heading in the right direction. <laughs> And uh, th this is a, a simple but true answer. We have a, a great team. We have the, 10 of the world's greatest arts organizations led by first-class leaders at Lincoln Center. We have a board of directors who are committed to uh, not just moving forward, but transforming the organization. And we're in the greatest city in the world. And you've got a base of people here who, who want to connect with each other, who want to connect with the arts. So any success we have is, is, is the sum of all those individuals. Uh, do you have a particular vision uh, for arts in the city? I do, but, but the vision for Lincoln Center isn't mine, it's John Rockefeller's. If you go back to the start of Lincoln Center, which is what I did when I started the job, and you get into the history, uh, it, was, it was him, at the, right at the beginning, who said the art, and these are his words, the arts should not be for the privileged few, but for the many. They should not be at the periphery of our lives, but at the center. And this is not mere entertainment. This is about human well-being. So we found that everything we've done at Lincoln Center on my watch uh, with the original Rockefeller vision, which is this is not for the privileged few, it's for the many. So the things you mentioned earlier, the reason we take so seriously things like K-pop, which is Korean pop music, or our outreach to the LGBT community, the reason we're doing that is because we want more people to feel more welcome. And for all the achievements of Lincoln Center, which are multiple, over the decades, I think it's fair to say the thing we haven't done as, as, as clearly or as intentionally as we need to do is to ensure that every New Yorker sees themselves at Lincoln Center, and, and that's what we're trying to do. So is this a kind of a crowdsourced approach where it uh, comes from the public and, and goes to you, or is it uh, top-down from you to the public? Uh, I, I hope we're meeting in the middle, right? I think we certainly, one of the things that I think we as cultural organizations sometimes don't do very well is build community. If you think about it, if you go see a show, uh, any, any cultural show, you buy your ticket, you go sit in your chair, maybe somebody talks to you, maybe somebody doesn't. If you clap at the wrong moment, you're gonna get shushed, and, and then you go home. And, and, and actually, we all need to do better with making people feel connected, not just to what they see on the stage, but to the people around them. So the reason we have we built New York's biggest dance floor on the plaza, right in front of Lincoln Center, the main plaza around the fountain, 2,700 person dance floor. We built that so New Yorkers could dance together. Uh, we now every summer have a wedding. We this do, is in the good weather. No, well, even in the bad weather. You know, you, New Yorkers, if they want to dance, they want to dance, nothing stops them. We, we have a wedding that we started doing after the pandemic. And the idea was you had all these people who had lost their weddings or had to have small weddings or Zoom weddings because of COVID. So we said, okay, let's give them a do-over. So we'll have a re-wedding. We'll give everyone a, ch a chance to get married again. We had 500 couples the first year. We had 700 couples last year. And everyone came to Lincoln Center to hear a concert, to dance on the dance floor together, to be together. And, and then I, get married. And they got married again. They all got remarried again. So w w there are people, fair to say, who see that kind of thing and their default is to assume it's frivolous. Their default is to assume this isn't serious. 
That's a word we hear too often. Uh, we, 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 this isn't serious. This is somehow diminishing something. And those people are frankly wrong. The, the truth of it is we as organizations have to connect with the world as it changes. We cannot rest on our laurels. And we have to hear in our head what John Rockefeller told us to do, which was to not serve just the privileged few, but to serve the many. And that's why you should come and dance at Lincoln Center in the summer. Well, and then you also did memorial services after COVID uh, that weren't available before uh, with Yo-Yo Ma and uh, things of that sort. Well, that was actually an example of the kind of crowdsourcing you, you were talking about. When, when we first, at the beginning of the pandemic, and we all remember those awful dark days in this city, uh, people couldn't bury their dead as in funerals of any faith group. So we worked with faith groups throughout the city to have every week a memorial for us all. And so we had different artists, Yo-Yo Ma, Winston Marsalis, Kelly O'Hara, Brian Stokes Mitchell. They would perform a live concert every week. And then people from all over the city would submit names of people they'd like to have memorialized. And those names would scroll across the screen. And, and I'm getting chills remembering it now because you remember just how many names you saw going across that screen of people who wanted to be remembered. And, and that's another reminder of, of the power of the arts that we, we often lose is that, that the whole point of the arts, sure, they can be fun and they can be trivial and like all the rest of it. But at the end of the day, they help us navigate what it is to be a human being. That, that's why Shakespeare endures, because there was a story, there was a truth about humanity that he told that has stuck with us for hundreds of years. And so we turn to the arts in our darkest moments, just as we turn to them in our brightest moments, because they tell us something about being human. Now, uh, John D. Rockefeller's vision was there for your predecessors, uh, but uh, they really failed to implement it in the innovative way that you have. Uh, it, is there a particular strategy that you adopted when you took over uh, uh, five years ago and, uh, and which you were implementing uh, as we sit here today? Look, I think all of us uh, stand on the shoulders of our predecessors. And uh, Lincoln Center has had 11 presidents, and all of them in their different ways have made a contribution to the advancement of the mission. The, the president uh, that, that is in my mind often is, is our third president, who, who is a composer called William Schumann. Very notable, very famous, uh, actually, as a composer. Uh, he was president of Juilliard. He was president of Lincoln Center. And he expressed something which captures uh, I think what we're trying to do at Lincoln Center, and, and I think why the arts matter so much. So he said this in 1965, maybe, a, a, and he could have been saying it today. He said, the arts are an antidote. They are an antidote to the push button emptiness of a mechanized world. They are our armor against disillusionment, and they are our armor against the self-destructive nature of man. I think about that quote every day, the push button emptiness of a mechanized age. And you flip forward 65 years to where we are today, and we have an entire generation of people who feel that push button emptiness, right? Who are, who are stuck, and it's not just young people, all of us now, who are stuck on devices. We see what that's doing to our levels of anxiety. We see what that's doing to levels of depression and self-worth of people of all ages, especially younger people, especially girls. And, and we need to escape that push button emptiness. And that's what the arts do. They take you away from something that is essentially an algorithm designed to sell you things, which is where we're spending most of our time now, and they take you to someone, whether they do it well or they do it badly, the art that we're creating at Lincoln Center or anywhere else is not just a subterfuge to sell you something. The art is there in some way to help you navigate something or understand something or confront something. And, and that's why the arts community in New York is so precious and it's why the arts are so important across this country. And you wrote a book uh, some years back called New Power. Uh, yes. New what is new power, and, and is it applicable in some way to Lincoln Center and what you just described? Sure. So the, the book, which was almost 10 years old now, we wrote it at the beginning of, of Web 2.0, so right when social media was, was rising. And uh, there was a lot of optimism back then. You remember we were told that you know Twitter was going to the Arab Spring and uh, had caused the Arab Spring, and there was going to be this great period of democratization, and we were going to be disintermediated by all these media barons who had captured us before, and we were going to be freed by these new platforms. And so what New Power said was, look, the world is, is changing in profound ways because of social media. Um, that means there are new ways of being powerful. And the old power world was how we were used to being powerful. So in the old power world, power was 
held by few. It was kind of top down. It was institutional. You know, a small number of media companies own the TV stations. They own the, 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 the radios. And they're able, able to conduct and control populations. New power works very differently. It's not what you can control. It's what you can make surge. It's about how you actually build crowds and currents around ideas. And so new power has been the thing which really has then over the last, I would say last 20 years, but particularly last 10 years, what we've seen is this rise of the connected crowd being the difference between being effective and being ineffective. So the companies, Airbnb, Uber, Facebook are all built on new power. The movements that have transformed our world, Me Too, Black Lives Matter, on new power movements, and even the political campaigns that have succeeded, uh, whether it's Barack Obama or Donald Trump, got into power because they worked out how to get this connected crowd shifting in the direction of their intentions. So that's the new power thesis, and, and we have certainly see it play out at Lincoln Center. How? So, how what, do you see it playing out at Lincoln Center? Well, the example you, you just gave is a very good one, which is the memorial for us all, which is this idea of, okay, how do you actually think about crowdsourcing grief in that context? But, but I'll give you another one. We have this idea of the, uh, the, the, the digital encore. So here's the digital encore. If you think about uh, the performing arts right now, we are one of the very few uh, sectors where phones are still completely banned, right? E even though if you ask young people, uh, they would rather give up their sense of smell than they would their technology. So this is becoming truly part of people. But often for the performing arts, for some good reasons, phones don't have a home. Because you don't want in the middle of a very beautiful and sensitive piece of music to be distracted by someone who is on Twitter. Having said that, if you have thousands and thousands of people coming and going to somewhere like Lincoln Center, and they don't have the opportunity to capture something and sharing it, you're leaving a lot of audience there who could be marketing your product out on the sidelines. So one of the things we've been very intentional about, particularly during the summer, is thinking about how people actually capture moments at Lincoln Center and share them with their audiences. And one of the reasons our summer audience is now uh, over 50% people of color, 50% uh, under 45, half new to Lincoln Center. Very different kind of audience. A lot of that is to do with the fact that people are sharing their stories of their time at Lincoln Center on Instagram, on Facebook, on TikTok, and that is drawing other audiences to us. So we think a lot now about what is the job of the audience to tell our story, which is very different from a world of some of my predecessors, where the way you told the story was you had your brochure, you had your New York Times ad, you had control of the power of communication, and you could set that on your terms. The shift we have to make is to understand that we have to think about our mission not being set in our terms, but how do we set it in terms of our audience? How does our community tell our story? And, and I think that's the challenge for Lincoln Center. I think it's the challenge for media. I think it's the challenge for politics. Okay, but when I uh, used to think of Lincoln Center, I thought of classical music. As you should. And even thought of classical music in the summer, in the mm -hmm. plaza, mostly Mozart or uh, uh, some of your other programs. And now we have... Uh, since Henry Timms, we have uh, hip hop and K pop and uh, uh, actually uh, multi ethnic uh, types of inspirations. Now, is this something that evolved or something that you thought of as a means of attracting more audiences? And is this a kind of mission creep uh, where uh, you're abandoning classical music in favor of? Uh, of other uh, genres uh, that uh, have been outside uh, Lincoln Center's warehouse, uh, wheelhouse in the past. Why have they been outside? Uh, well, when have you had, uh, prior to Henry Timms? We, we had them a whole bunch. You go back to the beginning of Lincoln Center and Mahalia Jackson's playing there. You look back some of the- Ah, Mahalia Jackson, but what about LGBTQ uh, uh, mariachi? Uh, well, I mean, look, the, if we're going to have a serious conversation about the LGBT community, if you think about, interestingly, the pride flag, on the pride flag, one of the colors is there to represent the arts because there is no community, or well, very few communities, I think, who have such a proud track record of contributions from the LGBT community than the artistic one. So the idea that that, that connection is new is absurd. And, and, and if you think about what we're trying to do at Lincoln Center, uh, it, it is notable that a vision that you've expressed now of Lincoln Center is one about the classical arts, but we are Lincoln Center for the performing arts, all of the performing arts. We have focused our time and our energy, I would argue, uh, on particular 
constituents and particular areas of focus. But to meet our mission, we have to expand beyond that. The question shouldn't be, why is there suddenly K-pop or hip-hop at Lincoln Center? The, the question should be, why on earth are we not doing more? Lincoln Center surely can't be criticized for not having enough classical music. There, there can't be 16 acres on earth where more classical music is cherished and promoted uh, and encouraged. And in fact, we as an institution just led a half billion dollar project to build a concert hall for the New York Philharmonic. So I, I will take no truck with people questioning our classical bona fides, but, but I will challenge all of those people making that critique to answer this question. If you're gonna be Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts, what about all those art forms that we haven't made central? Hip hop, uh, spoken word, um, poetry, contemporary dance, contemporary music, songwriting, Broadway. None of those things have a constituency in the way that Philharmonic does or the way that opera does at Lincoln Center. And I would argue that all of them should. So this is not a trendy thing. This is not a new thing. This is not mission creep. This is getting back to what the mission is supposed to be in the first place. Okay, I accept that. But uh, you have 10 constituents that are engaged in a variety of, of art forms, uh, mainly uh, classical art forms. Uh, and then you have uh, Lincoln Center, Link Inc., the top company that you uh, lead. Uh, each one, I think, or almost each one, has its own board of directors. Uh, each one uh, competes with all the others uh, for uh, uh, philanthropy, for funds, uh, uh, which are necessary to their subsistence. How does that all play out? Aren't they all in competition? Isn't there tension? Uh, 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 <laughs> aren't you uh, kind of uh, the host at a, a, a party of uh, warring factions? Uh, no, the, the, this, <laughs> is, this has been overblown uh, over the... Uh, I, I mean, there have certainly been... That's why I have you here, so you can tell I, I can, us how I can, it's I, I, can, I can underblow it. No, so there have certainly been moments, historically, no question, when there has been some tension, reasonable tension, between uh, Lincoln Center as, as, as the enterprise Link Inc. and some of the constituents. We've been trying very hard to re resolve that because Lincoln Center is made up. We are literally constituted by these 10 extraordinary organizations. So our job is to support them, is to, is to connect them, is to do everything we can to help them advance their mission. And I would certainly say it's true that strategically what I've been trying to do is to shift the institution so all of those organizations don't see us as a competitor, which certainly was the case in the past. They saw us doing things that were kind of on their turf, and they see us as, as expanding the vision of Lincoln Center, which again is one of the reasons why, um, you know, the, the New York Philharmonic, of course, is doing an extraordinary job of thinking about how symphonic music is a part of New York. And there's a decent argument that they don't need us competing head on with them in terms of the things that we're putting on the stages. I think that's a fair critique. They've made it in the past. So I think we are careful about that now in ways that we weren't as careful about previously. And I also think that if you go back of that story, some of the high points of Link Inc., the, the, the enterprise, the, the parent company, is when it realized there were gaps on campus. So at the beginning of Lincoln Center, there wasn't a chamber music society. It, it was because the, the board of directors realized that we were missing a mark by not having a chain music society. Back at the beginning, there wasn't a film society. Um, we realized that film was such an important art form. And of course, Winter Marsalis, who has been on your show before, back at the beginning, there wasn't jazz at Lincoln Center. When jazz was being presented, there was this question about, was it a serious art form? We, we've heard this before. And so one of uh, Lincoln Center's jobs, I think, is to always look at what's missing on campus. What are the gaps? What are the things that we aren't doing enough of? And to spend our time and intention there rather than doubling down on areas where I think our constituents are doing remarkably good jobs. Now, you're generally credited with having uh, lessened these tensions and uh, reduced uh, the, the conflict. Uh, how do you do that? Over a beer? Or uh, do you uh, uh, talk to these people and... Uh, and, and make, how do you make them see the light? That they all have to work together, that they're part of a, a cohesive unit. I think we have a shared vision. I mean, I think in, in full transparency, Lincoln Center has ten, it does tend toward wine and martinis rather than beer. I think that's definitely true. <laughs> but we have a culture of, of respect amongst the organizations and the leaders. We spend a lot of time together. Um, I think they see me as a, I, I hope they see me and they see our organization as great champions of the work that they do, which we should be. We should be the greatest cheerleader of anybody because uh, they, they literally make us who, who we are. And we try and do things which help. So that the, I'll give you an example. 
we have a new program called Lincoln Center Fellows. And the idea is to identify the, the great up and coming board members. Who are the people who in the, in the future are gonna be board members of all of our wonderful 10 organizations. And uh, to work for 18 months with each of these fellows uh, to learn everything about Lincoln Center, to learn about being a board member, and at the end of the project to get placed on one of the Lincoln Center boards. So we just finished our first class of fellows and we have six of them now on Lincoln Center boards as trustees. Our goal is 50 new trustees over the next five years to go to 10 of our institutions. And over 70% of the fellows are people of color. So it's also helping us make sure we have the most excellent boards in the city, which means the most diverse boards. So we're doing things like that, which are new efforts. So there is less of the tension that people did sense in the past. And I do think that they're seeing us as we should be, as someone who is a connector and, and, and a friend. Connector and a friend. Well, uh, one of your predecessors, Ren Levy, wrote a book. Uh, is the job particularly challenging? Do you find that the, there's a, it's a greater challenge than what you had at the 92nd Street Y, uh, which we, whence you came? And why do you think he said, why did I take this job? Is that a rhetorical question or is there an answer to it? <laughs> <laughs> I think they, the, uh, Ren's books, which is, um, which is enormously helpful, especially to me, as you might imagine. I would think it's a primer for the course. It, 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 it is essential reading for any new executive at Lincoln Center. <laughs> uh, he, he, he book, his book was called They Told Me Not to Take This Job, I think. And I, I, I certainly didn't have people telling me not to take this job. Uh, uh, I think people knew it was tough. Uh, it was going to be, and we had had a, a, a good amount of leadership churn before I arrived. So people knew it was not straightforward, but it's Lincoln Center. Like you have the opportunity. I used to walk past Lincoln Center when I first came to New York and think, it's just so amazing to see this with my eyes. That was it, just literally to see it, not even to go in, just I can't believe I get to see something this amazing. To think that one day you get to be the president. My friends said, go, 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 go. Um, but, you know, Ren is someone who I think, a along with many of our, our, our presidents in the past, did such an extraordinary job of, a, a tough job too, such an extraordinary job of advancing the mission of the performing arts, of speaking to the moment, of, of bringing the institution forward. And I would say this, I have been credited with lots of new things at Lincoln Center. None of them are new. There's nothing I've done here which someone hadn't done before. Nothing new under the sun. No. But and, certainly, and, 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 and certainly at Lincoln Center, we've looked backwards to, to find things that worked in the past and, and reclaim them, no question. But none of those are original innovations. Uh, is there something that keeps you up at night about Lincoln Center? Uh, uh, what, what do you consider to be the most challenging issues? I think it's always gonna be challenging to think about attention. I worry a lot about that now. Uh, I think we have reached a point where half of the world's spending half of its time online. It's a pretty extraordinary idea, right? So half of the world spending half of its waking hours essentially plugged into a device. And our business uh, remains a very in-person business. I, I think that the belief that that will be true in 10 or 20 years is a problematic one. Now, it was true 10 or 20 years ago, so it's, it was true 100 years ago. So people are uh, quite confident in this idea, but I worry a little bit about that. Uh, the optimistic view on that, however, is that we are gonna be quite well served because in a world in which we have been distracted digi digitally. We've been, dis we've been distracted digitally, we've been divided digitally. In, in that world, I think people are looking to find things that genuinely nourish them. They don't pretend to nourish them. And, and what I think organizations in the arts world do is offer nourishment to people and they offer truly human experiences. So I think there'll be this kind of return on humanity that we're gonna see that the arts world's gonna benefit from enormously, which is if you can provide a truly wonderful evening where people feel connected, they feel challenged, they feel part of a community, in a world in which the digital world is distracting us in such um, pernicious ways, the, the capacity to deliver that human moment will be great for organizations like Lincoln Center. Are there any specific plans for the future you can tell us about? We, we have many specific plans for the future. So we're thinking a lot about the west of campus. So we, we, the, the west of campus, uh, we have a, a wonderful park called Damrosh Park, which we've used for performances, but has never been a great venue for performances. We have to put up a temporary stage and it's never been the best park in New York because it's a lot of concrete. So we're working now with the community to think about what might be a better way of thinking about the west of campus? How could we use that to open up architecturally the campus 
to, 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 to think about how we can send the message, the message of inclusion we've been trying to send, how we can do that in a way which is going to make some architectural changes. So I think that's exciting. And I think we're beginning to think about a big light festival. A light festival. A light festival. I think it would be... Like sounds and lights. Yeah, I think it would be, if part of Lincoln Center's job, Link Inc., is literally to shine a light on Lincoln Center, how might we actually do that in an interesting way, uh, especially in the winter when it's going to be harder, I think, for any institution to, to get people out to come and see things in person. We're beginning to think about what an annual lights at Lincoln Center might look like, and, and I think that could be very exciting. Annual lights. Uh, so, uh, I have a question for you, Henry Timms, because we've uh, unfortunately come to the end of this uh, interview, which has been quite delightful and interesting. And my question is, uh, can we expect more diversified programming at Lincoln Center? Yes. We can. 100% yes. Henry Timms, thank you so much for coming by. Thank you. Thank you for coming by. Uh, tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Meanwhile, Take care, be well, and all the best.